Welcome to another Thank You Monday. I'm your host, Fluff. I wanted to say that really fast to see how it sound. Didn't sound great. That did not go how I wanted it to go. But I do have questions. So let's go ahead. Let's just dive right in, shall we? If you could name one piece of software or hardware that took your mixes to the next level, what would it be? Bobby, I saw that. How you doing? Uh, also, good question. Okay, this is going to be a weird answer. However, my answer would be uh, my new Neumann KH750 sub. Why? Why would I pick a sub as like a game-changing piece of hardware for my mixes? Because I never gave thought to matching a sub to the size of a room. And I used to run this huge JBL LSR sub and I thought it was great and it sounded so good. What I was not aware of was, it was actually doing more damage. It was doing more harm than good. So it was creating this huge null of crossover frequency awfulness. Um, it was too much. It was way, way too overkill. And there was no way to know what was too much and what was not enough, if that makes sense, because it wasn't made to work with the Neumann monitors that I have. And so for years, I was just super, super overkill on my mixes, which is why a lot of you have commented, why doesn't your mix have any low end? Well, that's why, because it has plenty of low end here, but that doesn't matter. It didn't translate. So fast forward to, I think it was almost a year ago now, Neumann, I'm a Neumann artist. I'm talking into a Neumann microphone. I have Neumann KH310 monitors. Uh, Neumann were like, hey, you want the matching sub to your monitors? And I was like, no, no thanks, I'm good. I don't, I don't need that. And they were like, you probably do. Like they're made to work with your speakers. Like why wouldn't you just, you know, take the sub. And I had to do a video for the MA1 or the M1A uh, room mic and basically the sub has calibration software and it will shoot your room and then calibrate it in the hardware. It's basically like Sonarworks EQ correction, room correction that is in the hardware. So it's not software based. And before I even shot the room, just hooking up the correct sub, which was, you know, it's a 10 inch or it's a, an eight inch, not a 12 inch like I had before. Uh, <laughs> it was much tighter, it was less boomy, and it was instantly night and day. Like, I couldn't believe how music sounded now. And then I shot the room and, you know, did a little bit of tweaking, but really when I shot the room, it was so much better with this sub than the other one. I would have never thought in a million years the, the sub would be the key to like really, really being able to hear my mixes correctly. I talked about in the last episode, being able to hear what you're doing correctly. That was the turning point for me in the last year. It was it was an epiphany. And I feel so stupid for me like, ah, sub's a sub, who cares? It's not the case. That's not the case at all. And I was so naive and dumb to think that. So yeah, to answer your question, my sub, my Neumann sub. What's your Chipotle order? Ugh, I'm hungry now. I want Chipotle. Typically at Chipotle, I will either get the quesadilla or I will get a burrito bowl with chicken double chicken uh pinto beans uh white rice maybe some queso depending on how i'm feeling sour cream lettuce uh red hot sauce the red chili sauce and a side of chips and I use the chips to then scoop in to go into my mouth it's very rare that i have chipotle these days though because i try to watch what i eat better <laughs> Uh, Chipotle is so good though. Chipotle. Like this video if you uh, like Chipotle. Fluff, good day to you, sir. What, in your opinion, are the pros and cons of stainless steel frets? I'm sort of a backyard guitar fix it guy, and I'm sure I'll get a request for them down the road. So I'm going to do a trial run on one of my own guitars. Thanks, Paul. Paul, good question. Also, kudos to you for uh, for doing your own repairs and doing your own work and stuff and, and doing it for uh, the ones around you in your community. Good for you. Okay, so stainless steel frets, uh, pros, uh, fret life wear, obviously they don't wear hardly at all. They, they wear so much slower uh, than a traditional nickel fret. Uh, they feel like glass. They feel so good 
compared to a nickel fret. Especially after wear and tear, and like if you're touring or in a humid climate or something like that, they're just awesome. Um, some cons, there's only two cons that I can think of off the top of my head, possibly a third. The first con would be uh, difficulty on your tools. And that's not really, I mean, I guess that's kind of an issue still, but when stainless steel frets first became really popular, it was really tough on the traditional fretting and woodworking tools. Um, not so much anymore, like nippers and stuff. Eh, it's it's pretty negligible from what I am told from some of my tech friends. But uh, difficulty working with stainless steel and also just cost. Like it's more expensive to the customer. However, you know, if, if you're gonna pay for it, you, you pay for it once and you never have to worry about a fret job basically ever again. So there is that. I typically, get most of my guitars refretted with uh, stainless steel if they do need to fret job, which is not not super, you know, common or frequent, but uh, like my uh, Gibson, my 77 Artist RD from Gibson, that's that has stainless steel frets in it. Uh, all my Music Mans are stainless steel frets. Um, another side effect of stainless steel frets, they're kind of slightly more top endy, I think. And I don't know if that's just my mind playing tricks on me, but I guess they could sound slightly different. Although Eddie Van Halen used to to staunchly, uh, uh, um, not admit, persist. He used to just say that uh, stainless steel frets don't sound any different. So whatever. The biggest con I can think of is string life. The, you know, stainless steel frets are very, very hard on strings. So you have to replace the strings more frequently. That's not really a big deal to me, but you know, for you, it might be, but yeah. Pros and cons, stainless steel frets, there you go. How does a good bass tone help complement a guitarist's tone in your opinion? Ethan, that's a good question. Um, often when I'm mixing, I will get a good bass tone that I like that works with the kick drum, bring up the guitars and then further shape the bass tone to fit in with the guitar tone, not the other way around, depending on what I'm doing unless it's like a bass centered thing, you want the bass to reinforce and support the guitar tone. That's what you want. You also want it to not get in the way of the kick drum and you know, other things that are in the low frequency like subs, you know, things like that if you have synth stuff. So really it can make or break your guitar tone. And I have slowly learned that like, you know, if I have muddy guitars, it's often not the guitars, it's the bass. And it's the frequency clash that is happening that is making the muddiness. So for me, the bass is where I'm gonna spend the most the most time shaping and EQing and carving and sculpting. Because if the guitars sound how I want them to sound and the drums sound how I want them to sound, well then the bass is gonna act like the glue between those two. I mean, that's how I look at it. Um, depending on the situation and the genre and music, of course, but generally speaking, that's how I will fine tune a bass. What are your thoughts revolving, I don't think that's the word you mean, the death of the big budget recording studio? Ryan, um, I think recording studios are an experience and what they do sell are, it is access to equipment that you could never afford and an experience, a vibe. And vibe is important when you wanna be in a creative, of creative state of mind. Costs of studio have dramatically come down. To put this into perspective, and I know it's LA, but when I recorded at Sound City in Los Angeles in Van Nuys in 2005, uh, Sound, Sound City was $3,000 a day for an eight hour day. Not including the engineer. It was very, it was like, that's, that's crazy money. Now compare that to today, up in the Northwest where I'm at in Seattle, um, I could find, you know, like London Bridge is a very celebrated studio where like all the grunge, you know, Pearl Jam records were recorded and all that kind of stuff. I think they're like $500 a day or something like five, $600 a day. And they have like a giant Neve console. So prices have dramatically changed with the digital age, but to, to totally eliminate and to have all of the studios go away and all the great drum rooms go away, 
I think that would be a huge disservice to music listeners and musicians. Um, yeah, there, a lot of them have gone away, but there's still good ones around. You know, like Blackbird in Nashville is a world-class studio. Um, dude, there's just, there's a bunch of studios that are still around and have adapted to the, to the modern digital ways. But yeah, I think, you know, I hope recording studios continue to be around for a long time in some way, shape or form, because it is a vibe and everyone who's a serious musician should experience it. Creativity is gone and I'm starting to resent my instruments and projects. Have you felt this way? And how did you get through John? I'm sorry you're feeling that way. Um, but to be fair, yeah, I felt that way. Um, I felt that way twice in my life and I, I just stopped playing and I took a break and I did something else that fueled the creative juices. Um, I don't know, I guess to some extent, uh, I was in that, in that rut when I started this YouTube channel and the YouTube channel actually kind of forced me to look at my playing and songwriting and riffing and all that kind of stuff in a different way. Because then if I did the riff thing, I could then go ahead and learn my video software or learn my recording software. And as a side effect, I had to play guitar in order to have something to record. And that kind of got my focus off of the instrument while also allowing me to kind of look at it in a fresh or maybe not necessarily fresh, but in a not focused way. I looked at the guitar as a, as a side effect, as it were. My early videos on this channel that you can go still go and watch, I was only doing the riff just to do the riff real quick so I could learn my recording, my recording software and my video editing software. That was my goal at that time. So I don't know, take up home recording, take up, and if you already are into recording, dive into that world, get some other people's projects, start mixing records or something like that. But definitely like breaks are okay and breaks are also healthy. So, you know, if you're feeling burnt out or whatever, take a break, it's all good. And that does it for this episode of FAQ Monday. If you have a question, feel free to leave them on down below in the comments or go on over to my Twitter or, you know, you, what, you know where I'm around, I'm around. And we'll get your questions answered shortly. Fluff out. If you liked the video you just watched, please consider subscribing. And if you wanna further support me and what I do, consider using some of the affiliate links down below in the description of this video. Go on over to Sweetwater, buy yourself something and help me out at the same time. It's a win-win for both of us.